All right, well, looking forward to getting started here. So uh, good morning and good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Uh, thanks for joining us for this webinar. Excited to uh, share some lessons out from uh, experienced um, uh, staff and organizations that we have joining us today. Our webinar today, uh, site planning for EPCs, um, impact of charging and energy management on system planning. Uh, I'm Eric Bigelow with the Center for Transportation and the Environment, uh, Director of Midwest Operations. I head our office for CTE in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, with me, I have Sarah Wugan from the Mobility House, head of USA Operations and Analytics, and Thomas Burton with ABM, uh, Director of E-Mobility and Electrical Infrastructure. So uh, I'd like to give a, a bit of context here. So. Um, Successfully delivering turnkey EV charging depot uh, really needs expert guidance um, on a whole number of things. This is a uh, number of EV charging stations needed, um, how to plan for the future proofing of those, um, thinking about both uh, the soft side of um, interoperability software network needs, but also you know the uh, stub ups, concrete, transformers, and, and long range planning. Um, and also having a really good eye is how that fits together with your utility. Um, because if you have all the best looking charger sites, but uh, utility doesn't give you a connection, um, it's a lot of work for not. So uh, certainly keeping your utility involved is it. So um, with that, I'll go and jump in. Uh, um, great, so a few, uh, a little bit about uh, CT. Uh, we're a 5.1 C3. Um, nonprofit engineering and planning firm. Um, and our, our mission is to help make zero emission vehicle projects successful. So we do that in a variety of ways, um, but really uh, are, I think, uh, un, un, unique in a lot of ways in the nonprofit world from having a majority engineers and technical staff um, that help make these projects happen. So, um, uh, really love uh, diving in, uh, you know, getting into the details and weeds and, and really understanding what these challenges are and, and bringing that forward to help um, help future projects be successful. So um, uh, ha have over 130 active projects right now across the country. Um, and uh, really, if it's uh, a, a zero emission transportation, something uh, we're, we're interested in. So. Uh, we work in uh, four different service areas, so talking um, much more on the kind of planning side, but we work out work throughout the entire, uh, I guess, uh, zero emission vehicle life cycle from early stage prototype and demonstration projects, first of a kind vehicles, um, potentially too risky and, uh, for uh, full commercial use, but something where uh, there's kind of a, a real potential for a future market. Uh, through uh, deployment, project and deployment planning, um, really throughout the entire life cycle of getting a vehicle uh, uh, pilot or larger fleet, um, all the way from initial contracting uh, through the full uh, life cycle and getting those in, in successful service. Um, and then looking at fleet transition planning on uh, really from across the zero emission spectrum, what it, what it takes to get uh, small, medium, large, um, uh, Transit, school bus, you know, municipal fleets. Um, how how to think about that from a staging and implementation standpoint, um, and really trying to come at it from kind of a fact based and truth side. So, I uh, um, so I just want to put some that up. Uh, we have uh, we we have uh, four regional offices, but uh, we really support projects across the country. Um, we need to work on the Dakotas. I know. Um, and but I just want to say we we really do work on our zero emission projects across the country. It's not not just uh, California or just the coasts. It really is uh, nationwide. Um, and I wanted to uh, speak a little bit as, uh, for you know where we where we come from in this and from a standpoint of of really being living in the technical weeds of what it takes to make uh, zero emission vehicles successful. Uh, we've had a number of you know early prototype and startup vehicles, um, and uh, you know back throughout our history. So a few of them listed here, um, and that's that's really part of our DNA as an organization and, and understanding how how those technical details fit together um, and how the how making those vehicles successful helps um, kind of enable uh, and accelerate 
the ecosystem, you know, to be more, be more successful. Um, and on uh, again, the fleet transition side, really, uh, this is sort of the, uh, we do all of the planning side until it gets to kind of stamped drawings, stamped engineering drawings, so uh, we bring in other partners for. Um, so um, from the, just as a, a window into kind of the acceleration of the market, this is uh, today is, is about, uh, you know, a specific part of kind of the planning and life cycle. But just the uptick in fleet transition and planning projects that we're seeing um, is really accelerating quickly. So, you know, this has had started this, you know, there were folks recognizing the need um, five years ago, and it's no, no secret to anyone today that there is just a, a lot of understood need and a lot of need for expertise as well um, to really try and get some of these answers right. Um, so to kind of, uh, you know, Talk a little bit about where we are uh, today. I think as an industry, um, I want to talk a bit about the evolution of what I call deployment challenges. And this is thinking through um, as the as we've watched this industry grow and evolve. What um, what are the kind of the current challenges as some, as, that people are facing um, today? And as that's evolved over the last ten to fifteen years. Um, you know, what's, what's the current challenge? And so, you know, 10 and 15 years ago, there really were fundamental questions on, you know, will this vehicle work? Does this vehicle even exist, for instance? So the questions were vehicle focused. Um, and, you know, probably I would say in the six or seven years ago question, um, for a lot of use cases at, at a fundamental level, the answer is, okay, that's great, it works. For, um, uh, questions per, then kind of once the vehicle was okay, you know, this is a bit ancient history, if the vehicle is okay, it's like, wow, how do we do this infrastructure or does the infrastructure work? Um, what chargers do we trust that when we plug them in, it's going to work? Once those were there, really gets into a planning question is like, okay, so the vehicles work, we, we believe the chargers. And again, this is already, this is years ago at this point into a question of what is the right vehicle that I need? And now these fundamental questions are answered. What is the vehicle that I need? What is the infrastructure that I need? What, and so how do I chart this path? Um, once a, as part of that, I guess we, we look at this really is pretty typically rolled together from a standpoint of how do I pay for this? You know, what's the right number of zeros? Um, so having, um, and that can, there can be, uh, you know, from a kind of creative or financial standpoint, how do you how do you close the gap? Um, some sometimes you can find net savings. Many times uh, these vehicles are and infrastructure it is still more expensive. Um, getting past the uh, the dollar science question um, really gets into how do I do this? How do I put this in the ground? How do I get this fleet? Um, and these last three questions are largely that is much more where most of the industry is today in a lot of ways. You know, how do I, um, once it's understood what you need, the question becomes, how do I pay for this? Um, how do I get this in the ground uh, infrastructure? How do I get the vehicles that I need on order? And then once those pieces are in place, how do I manage this? So um, in corp, you know, um, coming, coming from the place of a nonprofit, you're really wanting to uh, accelerate the advance and adoption of zero emission vehicles. Um, you know, this is really coming from someone who wants all this to be successful. Uh, there's new challenges that come in managing zero emission vehicles. So I don't say that to be negative, but as, as something as part of um, both, you know, new challenges and new opportunities. But how do you how do you manage that? And this, these are as the as fleets advance and the size of the fleets grow. Um, those are sort of the uh, kind of the next up and coming things. So. It's so a really exciting ecosystem of, of partners out there to help you support that. We have a couple on today um, with Mobility House and ABM, um, both members of CTE and happy to have them join. So uh, kicking us off today on um, our panel side, uh, Sarah Wugan, um, head of USA operations and analytics at the Mobility House. Um, prior to the Mobility House, um, Sarah worked at STEM Incorporated leading stationary battery storage uh, and has experience in the utility consulting for demand side management. Um, at the Mobility House, Sarah leads the US implementation and operations for their charge pilot planning, uh, as well as other consulting to help uh, customers with fleet electrification. So 
Uh, with that, Sarah, uh, if I can hand it off to you. Thanks, Eric. Um, share my screen here. Hey everyone, um, thanks for joining today. As Eric said, my name is Sarah and I head up our operations and analytics for the Mobility House. Um, today we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the most um, important things that, that you need to know to electrify your depot, electrify your fleet. Um, first, a bit about the Mobility House. We are a 13 year old company with over 250 employees um, from across the world that all share the same vision to build a clean transportation and energy future. We're trusted by over 800 fleets uh, with over a thousand charge pilot deployments. And during our many years, we've developed a lot of great partnerships across the industry, uh, some of whom, some of these partners you're hearing from today, CTE and ABM, to help you electrify your depots. So kind of jumping into it here, how can we help you to electrify your depot. Well, with the Mobility House and our partner network, we can really start with helping you plan ahead and then be with you along your entire journey of construction and actually operating and maintaining these depots. So starting at the beginning, why is planning ahead so important? Um, we're gonna first talk about the importance of charging and energy management and, and what that, that means. Simply putting chargers in the ground can result in vendor lock-in, higher upfront costs, um, higher operational costs, and that's where charging energy management really comes into play. I'm gonna show you a bit now of, of how that is and what it does. So by considering charging and energy management while you're doing your upfront planning, um, you can improve your site's CapEx, you know, capital costs, and OpEx, operational costs. Uh, this is because Charging and energy management can help you manage your electricity costs that you're paying to the utility. If say you had something like a time of use rate where it costs the most to charge in the middle of the day or the peak times, maybe around 5 p.m., something you might be similar with or familiar with from home. Um, but charging energy management can also help you significantly reduce both the costs and time upfront by utilizing the existing grid infrastructure, um, that grid infrastructure is gonna define how much power was available to the site. With charging and energy management, you can install more chargers than what's available at the site and avoid needing to do an upgrade, which can be really costly, really timely, depending on you know, where you are, a lot of different factors there. So how do we help with this? Well, to start with, um, we would do charging and energy management modeling during your planning period along with our partners. Um, this is gonna help you better predict how your charging will be optimized throughout your depot to reduce those peak loads or inform how you wanna build out the site. Our experience team would start with gathering information about your fleet, such as how many vehicles, what types of vehicles, what are the vehicle schedules, and uh, various information about your site maybe what utility serves you, what rate you're currently on, what kind of limits you have, what if there's a site load on the same meter or a different meter, and so on. After analyzing this with our proprietary simulations, we provide you meaningful insights that are going to help you plan. So things like how many charging stations you need, which power of charging stations you should purchase. Um, we're going to forecast how you can use your existing site grid limit without upgrades utilize on-site generation you might have and take advantage of you know, potential future revenue opportunities with what we call vehicle grid integration. Here's one example of a planning that we did for a customer. Um, this customer has a lot of vehicles on a time of use electricity rate. And as you can see, you know, if there was no charge management at all on site, no throttling or anything, these vehicles would come back from their daily routes all within the same hour, start charging at full power, and you'd get this really high peak that you can see here on the graph, um, over three megawatts that you would need to use. With charging energy management, um, we can really flatten that out and we're saving the customer here 67%, um, more than that. So they're paying less than a third on their monthly electricity bill than what they would otherwise be paying. This is another example um, of some planning we've done for a customer. 
with this site, they had a microgrid. So they had solar, battery storage, and an on-site generator. With our charge pellet optimization or charging energy management optimization, we were able to flatten that peak um, overnight so that it could be optimized for the load that the generator needs to continue operating. And we were able to take advantage of those midday solar peaks for um, kind of the rush hour routes that they need to make on either end of that. So now we talked a little bit about why you need to upfront plan, but how else can the mobility house help you? As I mentioned in the beginning, you know, we're with you every step of the way of your electrification journey. So, so what else can we do for you? Well, we can provide charge pilot. This is our charging and energy management software that could be operating at your site. With charge pilot, um, it would help you reduce your charging costs while giving you some centralized monitoring, a really technology agnostic solution, and it's modular and expandable. So charge pilot um, really features a lot of different benefits to your Zepo. Um, it's a resilient solution. It provides redundancy from outages or downtime, you know, internet loss. Uh, first off, you have a local controller. It's this little orange and gray thing you're seeing in the image on the screen. That's gonna connect to each charger via an ethernet or a cat cable. And that's gonna make sure that any, you know, over the air losses aren't impacting your optimization on site and your ability to charge. Um, we can use charge pilot with any charger using open charge point protocol or OCPP. So it uses open standards and it allows you to have chargers from different manufacturers, different types of chargers all at one depot. Um, you also get real time system monitoring. So with our web portal that you'll, you'll see some a little bit here on the screen now, you can real time see what's going on at your site have some control over things like prioritization, starting and stopping, and also download data that you might need for reporting or just to really understand what's happening with your charging. Charge Pilot can also optimize alongside um, a lot of different solutions. So we can optimize alongside a microgrid or take into account your solar, um, working with your fleet tools, for example, for your scheduling. So a lot of different modular solutions there. Another way the Mobility House can help you is with our charging as a service offering. This is a turnkey solution that means absolutely no upfront costs for you. You'll get a predictable, reliable solution. You'll have, you only have to deal with a single provider and it's gonna include everything you just heard about. So our charging as a service team will provide you all that upfront planning that we talked about the importance of the construction, the operations, which will include that charge pilot software. And it's all for a set pay per mile price. And so um, that's all gonna come with no upfront cost and no cost and no responsibility to operate or maintain the charging infrastructure. What I'm showing here is an example of a uh, charging as a service depot, a turnkey solution. This was a delivery fleet with 200 vans that run six days a week in Southern California. With charging as a service, they're able to take their current fueling cost that comes out to about 29 cents per mile and reduce that all the way down to 11 cents per mile by using electric vehicles. And um, while doing that, they are also able to avoid this $435,000 upfront cost for the infrastructure. So it really comes out in your favor. Um, you're paying less per mile and you're avoiding all that upfront to get the chargers. So now you know a lot about what the mobility house can do, why you need to plan ahead um, and, and how you should be operating your depot, but why, why work with us and, and our partners that you're hearing from today? Well, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, we are the most experienced fleet charging company worldwide. Um, we have experience by over a thousand fleets in smart charging. We have numerous vehicle grid integration and vehicle to grid pilots. 
We also work with our vehicle OEM partners to do some second life and zero life stationary storage with the batteries from their vehicles. And with our planning services, we've helped hundreds of fleets. So our technology is really leading the way. Um, you know, we're, we're really paving the way to have a fully realized vehicle grid integration future for a sustainable grid. You know, in the past, people just wanted to make sure they could charge. There was a charger when they needed it to be and it would be on. Now we're hearing a lot of folks are, you know, finding that minimizing costs is a very important aspect of their charging, as we just talked about. And in the future, we really want to help get to that sustainable grid. So, you know, while the mobility house is already paving the way in a lot of these things, let's take a step back, talk more about how you can benefit from working with us and our partners to electrify your fleet today, to minimize your costs today and the things that you really need to, to be thinking about. Here we have a site with 24 chargers and um, they're operating on a time of use electricity rate to, designed for electric vehicles. With charging energy management, they're able to save almost $100,000 per year. This project was extremely successful, um, pretty much completed in, in record time uh, because we did it with a trusted network of experienced partners. And by, by working with these partners and gaining more experience, we're able to learn a lot of key takeaways that we'll bring to you and your next project. So, you know, us and our partners, we're gonna help you figure out how to future-proof this, um, future-proof what hardware and construction and cabling you need on site, find funding opportunities for you, coordinate timelines. Um, this is very complicated, shipment of different items, construction timelines, all the interoperability testing. And we can work with your staff to educate and train them on, on how to use this. This is all very new to, to everyone. Here's another example of um, one of our customers. This is um, King County Metro. They saved a lot of time and money by using Charge Pilot to avoid a grid upgrade. Um, they wanted to control 4.6 megawatts of power on a 2.5 megawatt site and using charge pilot, um, they're able to, to do that successfully, saving them years and money. Um, this customer also had a really important vision of interoperability. They wanted to use chargers from three different manufacturers and two types of chargers from each manufacturer. With charge pilot's interoperable solution, we were able to help them do that. Finally, um, here's another example of a deployment in Europe. Um, this site, we're able to keep them at 80% below their grid limit. So they have five megawatts on site, but we're able to keep them below one megawatt. And we're managing over 150 individual charge sessions per day. So these buses are, are coming through multiple times per day. And in doing so, we're saving them several hundreds of thousands of dollars per year in their demand charges. So thank you for your time and, and please don't hesitate to, to reach out and let us know how we can help you today. Um, and I will will pass it off now to Thomas from ABM. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, and I just I was, I forgot to mention this is the far at the start. A couple people have submitted questions through the, the QA. So um uh do uh we'll 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 have a Q and A and questions section uh, at the end after Thomas's presentation, but uh, feel free to go ahead and send any of those in now. So, um, with us now, uh, thanks, uh, is Thomas Burton, uh, Director for E Mobility and Electrical Infrastructure at ABM Electric Power Services, um, as, which is a part of ABM Enterprise. Uh, Thomas is responsible for the leadership, daily activity, and training for a team of engineers, estimators, and project managers. Uh, focusing on the United States and Canada. Um, uh, Thomas, take it away. All right. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> Sarah, great insights. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit about who ABM is and, and where we've come. Um, currently, our e-mobility business has been going for 11, almost 12 years. We have, by the time we finish our lot of chargers that we have on the books right now, we'll have installed 28,000 ports of public charging across the US. We've 
made our mark in the industry by doing large scale deployments for the OEMs of automobiles, BMW, Audi, Volkswagen, Porsche, uh, Jaguar, Land Rover, General Motors, and now moving into Ford. We're a service and facilities company at heart. So just a little bit about who we are and what we do. We try and do the whole ecosystem with our clients all the way from planning through to installation and service and maintenance, backend support. Uh, again, with our partners, uh, CTE and Mobility House and others. I just wanted to give you a glance at what everybody's goals are to show what's ahead for the infrastructure. And I just took a couple of our OEM clients and put their electrification goals on this slide. Harley Davidson came out with the lighting in 21, 22. Audi says by 2026, they'll be 100% electric. By 2030, BMW is committed to about 50%. And Porsche, I believe 80%. And Volvo and Mini Cooper, they're gonna be 100% by 2030. By 2035, GMC, Sprans, GM, Cadillac, and Volkswagen have committed to 100%, and Ford by 2050 uh, as they're moving through the, their electrification programs now. This is, this is great for all the passenger cars, light and medium duty, the SUVs that'll be coming, like the Hummer that was at the top of my presentation, which are the cars that people are looking for and, and moving from the luxury brands and the low end smart cars into more of the cars of the everyday person. And the adoption rate is really taking off. This shows some predictive curves from some of the industry leaders on where they think the electrification will go and how many millions of cars will be sold. And if you look at where we're at today, we're at the knee of the curve. We're, we're, we're not even starting the bend. And we think we have about 2% of the automobiles are EV sales now, and it's just going to expedite, take off in a logarithmic pattern here as, as time goes on with the predictions from the, uh, from the people in the, in the OEM world. You know, I'm often asked, you know, my building, my facility, not from a fleet aspect, just from everywhere else, what do I need to put in? So I thought this slide was very um, important for everybody. You know, most charging is a level two charger and it will continue to be that way. The DC fast chargers are made for quick turn vehicles, depending on your use case, extending your, your travel. Um, you know, the vehicle to grid that's coming with the ISO 151108 and plug and charge and these new technologies that are emerging, it's very important to make sure what you put in the ground today and your infrastructure and your layout and the conduit size can adapt as the industry adapts because we're, we're really a virgining industry. I was in a trade show this week and one of the telecom guys that is now an e-mobility person brought his bag phone with him where he had a battery and then a cord coming to a handset and that was the cell phone equivalent of where we are for EV charging and e-mobility is a, is a visual. I think everybody can adapt to that knowing that we all have a smartphone in our pocket now that's a supercomputer. So we need to, we need to keep pace with that and watch what we're doing. The level three charger I still think is a necessary installation at every location for when something doesn't go right. Um, the car is plugged in, it started charging, but as you walk away, it shut off. Or the person the night before didn't plug in the vehicle and you get in there in the morning and you were scheduled to use it and it doesn't have the charge. <clears throat> so the level three, I think, is an amenity for our clients, is a amenity to have a recovery system and the, the network power to go with it. And when you, when you have a dependent fleet in an application, you're going to start to talk about, you know, resiliency from a grid connectivity side. 
do I need the peak shaving or the load management, or do I need the on-site storage, or do I need an auxiliary way to power my fleet in case of an emergency? A lot of vehicles that are being used now in the market are the, uh, the Mach-E, for example, is a favorite for police departments, right? They need that asset up and ready to go. So their resiliency play on their charging and having a, a rigid structure to make sure that they have the power available when they need it is very critical. You know, the fire engines are coming. We work with the Rev Fire Group. They're starting to electrify pumper trucks, ambulances. The, this fleet application does not have a nine to five call out duty. It's multiple shifts, multiple a day. Designing and handling for that is, is really important. So understanding your use case, what your needs are, and what equipment's available and networks and, and controls to make everything happen is very important. And planning by far is, is the most important thing. If you're, if you're going there next year, the year after, three years, oh, I'm not going to do this for a couple of years, you need to start talking to people today to get everything in line so that when you turn the switch, and you're ready to make the decisions, everything is available to you. Uh, some of the things that everybody that's doing this are gonna ask of your facilities are site plan. You're gonna say, why do I need a site plan? Because we need to understand where the utilities are, what the right-of-ways are, where the embedded conduits are for light poles, because you're gonna do construction, you're gonna do civil things. Having this available allows us to plan appropriately to minimize conduit runs, lengths of installations, where we're gonna put the fleet, the chargers, the, the areas to help reduce the cost of implementation by smartly thinking about it. And that's, that's also with the one-line drawings. And if you don't have these drawings available, which happens quite frequently, I would say probably 40% of the time, our clients do not have this existing documentation. It adds time, complexity, and cost to the development of your site in, in your chosen area. Um, before COVID, it was usually asking for 12 months of utility bills. And what we're looking for is your demand load, what, what your peak demand is in those months. Now we're starting to ask for two years due to the variable nature of the buildings and how workforce and usage has changed. So we, we come up and ask for that, a much bigger ask. So if you're planning on doing this, start pulling your, your documentation together. It's going to save you money and frustration in the long run. Uh, I, I wanna walk you down like the implementation pathway because you decide you're going to do this, you decide on a vehicle, now we have to look at what the use case is pull all the information together and really say, okay, here's what you should do, right? Because the, the biggest cost you're gonna get is your infrastructure. Putting a shovel in the ground, digging up asphalt or concrete or hardscape or directional boring, you know, it's, it's going to be much more expensive than the cost of the vehicle or the cost of the charger alone. So proper planning and allowing flexibility in that design to expand or to go to the next widget that comes out with a newer charger that has bi-directional capability or what five and 10 years down the road are gonna to bring to us as we continue to innovate and make better decisions and better equipment and better software available for everybody. So initiation, get, you wanna talk about, I wanna do this, we wanna head there, pull your documentation together, start looking at your site, start talking to the utilities to make sure they have capacity available, right? Think about what you can do. Can I, can I delay charging overnight and lower my peak impact on the grid and make it happen with a smaller service size? Can I get efficiency out of that? You know, that's where we go and do the site consultation. We talk about the facility layout, uh, how do we future proof? What are the ADA requirements? And, and I don't know how many clients have come to us and said, I don't need to worry about ADA, it's a private fleet until their 
employee hurts themselves and is on crutches and they go, I can't access this because there's no walkway and now it becomes an ADA issue. I tell all my clients, everybody has to consider ADA, whether it's public or private, ADA requirements, even though there's no uh, van, accessible van that has a, a wheelchair lift with it right now in an e-mobility environment, that will change. So we have to plan and install based upon the ADA guidelines. Um, you know, we need to get in there with the contractors, do the documentation, the estimating, the engineers, get the proposals out, get the, the budgets in place, and then go and discover what rebates, incentives, tax we can help find and pull together for our clients to bring a package that will give them the, the best bang for their buck. The, the construction, the permits, the scheduling, that's, that's gonna impact your business, right? Maybe that parking space that we're electrifying has a, an ICE engine vehicle in it now that needs to park there for the, for the transition period because that's where they park at night. You know, if you don't have space available for lay down areas for the construction, for temporary parking for those vehicles in another area, we have to talk about that and work all that out. And then finally, the life cycle, the closeout. Here's what you have. Here's how you use it. Here's how it works. Who's your responsible party financially on site, uh, operationally on site? You know, who do you coordinate with? Here's the warranty begins. Here's the maintenance that needs to happen. You know, when, when you're a heavy user of this equipment, it requires a heavier maintenance than a residential use or a slow use area. So building that into your budgets to make sure that you're properly maintaining it and handling it is very appropriate. Uh, you know, a simple deployment, couple stations at a thing at a building, you can find the power on a panel somewhere. You can probably get it in, get through permitting in weeks, right? We're talking short duration. Long duration schedules with the delivery constraints. Let's say you need a medium voltage transformer and you're 60 weeks out, right? Um, you know, the electrical switch gear is a problem right now and getting it in a timely fashion down to even some of the breakers. We did, ABM did a 1200 port install at LAX airports. And during this time period, we couldn't get two pole 40 amp breakers to run chargers. They were just back ordered to the chip problems. So understanding those requirements and what these durations are really gonna look like is a, is a real issue and problem in the industry. So Eric, I want to open up the questions or move on? Yeah, Thomas, thanks for that. Thanks for the overview on um, I mean, how, how these pieces fit together, what it's like to carry those projects from kind of concept to reality. So. Um, I guess, you know, thinking about, I guess, on, um, on that note that you brought up, Thomas, thinking about kind of lead times, it's certainly something that we've heard a lot about. Do you have either advice for folks or kind of insight or how, how's it looking from, um, the, the installer's perspective from getting these things in the ground? Yeah. I mean, it, it's a little difficult in every region, right? The, there's, over 3,000 utilities in the United States. And every one of those utilities have different requirements for a switch gear, right? It's a different head end, a different box. So the manufacturers can't standardize, right? So if I need a meter section in a piece of switch gear, it has to be made for that specific utility. So this stuff becomes special. It's not off the shelf. It can't be built and ready to go and quick ship. You know, we have AHJs that are taking time with the drawings. You know, nobody's gonna order that switch gear that's custom until it's past the permitting and the AHJs issues and gotten approval because if something needs to change, it's going to be very costly once you order it, right? So that, that whole planning and design and, and process and think out needs to really be examined and handled. You know, we, we can come in early, we can select a piece of 
charging equipment. We can select the network. We can select how we're going to do it, the pieces, the parts, the load management, you know, upsize the conduit. So the conduit has a bigger capacity for future in case we want to change from a 7.2 kW charger to a 19.2 or go to a larger DC. Um, when, when you're digging that ground up, that increase in that conduit size or that hard infrastructure is a very small investment during that time that can give you a large bang for your buck later on because you're, it gives you the ability to change without digging up the costly trench or concrete. You know, when you're talking fleets, it's heavy concrete, right? It's not just standard pavement. So it has another layer of complexity. And, and just work, work, working through those, right? What is the best choice for that client for their future goals and their future planning? Because everybody, when they start, they dabble in it, right? They don't say, I'm gonna electrify my entire fleet tomorrow because they're scared of it, right? They have to understand the nuances of how you operate the, this fleet, this E-fleet versus a, a ICE fleet or something else. So they have hesitancy. They have corporate governance that says we can only afford this much capital to get these many vehicles at this time. You know, there's many things that go on in a company, like Sarah was mentioning earlier, changing from a CapEx to an OpEx solution can help get you there quickly and, and make it more affordable for your clients. But really thinking through it, I think, is the best thing. And having that open conversation and being honest with your partner. You know, you may not select ABM. You may not select Mobility House or CTE or somebody else as a client. But whoever you say, I'm going to trust, make sure you trust them. And make sure they know what they're talking about. Because they will guide you. We're, we're in this every day. We're in the trenches. I think... ABM has 5,000 open installation projects right now in our books, right? And that's what we manage on a, on a normal basis. So the, the amount of infrastructure, the amount of conversations that we have really make a difference when, when, you, when you grab hands and you walk down the road together. Eric, it's a... In some sense, um, you know, a lot new and, and, and to your point, in some sense, a lot of this, is, some of this is not very new of, you know, large picture infrastructure installations. It's just um, a lot of ways new, the customers and who's, who needs it is new uh, in a lot of ways. Um, so I guess as a question about total control power, um, you see that in the thing. Um, so if you speak to that, I know from, from our experience, we've seen this um, uh, and, the, and the, the question is, um, you know, how, I guess we have to read it, um, sh there's a, sometimes a mismatch between what the site needs, uh, say the site might need several, you know, three kilowatt, three megawatts, the utility says we have one megawatt, uh, someone like the mobility house or other provider can say, great, we can keep your cost, or we can keep your demand at a megawatt. Um, we've seen utilities say, sounds good. And we've seen utilities say, you have three megawatts of chargers please provide three megawatts of uh, up everything upstream um, all the way to the utility connection. So Sarah, I guess if you can uh, you know, share anything on that and what that looks like from either uh, convincing utilities or, or, or to, to take that stance that you can control that or, um, or a lot of times you see this as a take it or leave it from the utility. Yeah, thanks for that question. It's a great question. Um, so, you know, the short answer is, is going to be it depends. Um, in the U.S. right now or North America, there, there's not any standards on this. So it is up to each individual utility or AHJ um, to could become very complicated. In our experience, um, you know, I gave the example of King County. This is one where the utility in the AHJ was, was completely, you know, content with our solution. We've had some other AHJs where we've gone back and forth a little bit to show them how it is that that a solution like charging energy management can avoid you know anything dangerous happening here. Um, over in Europe, our team um, has worked to help get you know policies in place for this. Uh, right now in Germany, there is just a requirement that you have to have a local controller. So similar to the device I showed in my slides in order to be able to do this. Um, we're actively you know, engaging in a lot of ongoing conversations in the US to, to try to develop some standards around this so that for everyone in the industry, it could be easier moving forward for utilities and AHJs to give approval. 
Um, yeah, and I, I also think this is something that hopefully uh, any utilities that are uh, difficult with this can become more enlightened, you know, as, um, but from, you know, talking to, from my perspective, talking to utilities, um, there's a lot of, uh, I think, well-placed fear that too much, too much control being placed at the edges of the grid really makes, um, makes for an uncertain future from the grid you know we have a lot of expectation when you flip the switch the lights stay on <laughs> so utilities have a um, a lot of concern right now and how quickly things move so yeah i um, think it's just education and, and showing you know the experience of all the providers out there um and apologies i, I use the term ahjs um that would be authorities having jurisdiction so those who are doing the permitting yeah thanks um so I really appreciate your thought on the ADA access because it's a it's a really good um, it's a really good point. From when you've seen this come up as a question, is this um, primarily around uh, access for like maintenance, like someone on crutches needs uh, from the maintenance staff, or is this uh, access to a plug, like an end user? It's access to the plug in the in the end user. The uh... The federal government came out with standards, um, what, a month or two ago, where they just redefined what the ADA requirements are. Um, it's uh, so many parking spaces. When you start to electrify your area, the first one has to be van accessible. And then based upon the quantity, it has to be standard accessible or general accessible. And they cannot be existing ADA spaces. So you can't say, oh, I have this ADA space here. Let's just take that one and make it hmm. accessible. So you're going to lose parking spots to make these five foot aisleways, for example, in your, in your area. And I have a lot of people that say, you know, we don't want to do that. We, we don't want to give it up. It's not really being enforced here. And we strongly recommend that they do it. It's, going to come back and bite them when they go to do a building expansion or another project and they come back and review and say, you didn't follow ADA standards. We're now enforcing it. You got to go back and fix this. You know, so we'll, we'll put it in and maybe not stripe that five foot aisle way for them and leave it as a regular parking spot. But if they get in trouble later, they can just stripe it out and move on. You know, we'll, we'll try to strongly encourage them. I mean, the customer's always right, right? They're paying the bill but you have to give them the professional guidance that they need and, and desire um, to get through those. Great. Thanks. Yeah. A good, uh, definitely good, good advice. Um, excellent. So uh, there's a question in the chat. I guess a quick one for, for CT that I'll take is if um, CT uh, only works with Mobility House and ABM. Uh, we work with, uh, we have CT as uh, around 100 member companies that we work with kind of across the zero emission landscape. So um, we work with lots of folks and uh, we're, we're a nonprofit. Our goal is to help get these uh, technologies uh, successfully out in the world. So, but um, uh, always, always excited to work with uh, great groups like ABM. Uh, and Mobility House. So, um, excellent. So, um, I guess, uh, let's see. Um, Sarah, I guess uh, you mentioned uh, charging as a service um, and for kind of the, um, you know, Thomas, you mentioned, you know, turning a CapEx into an OpEx. Uh, are you seeing an uptick in, in interest in that? I know it's something that's been talked about, you know, for, for many years um, from someone who, who, who puts those in the ground. Is that something you're seeing an uptick of um, either interest uh, and uh, things getting booked? Yeah, um, absolutely an uptick in interest. Um, you know, in general, there's an uptick in interest in the industry, but absolutely sure. this ability to avoid a lot of that upfront costs and to have you really the one one key person handle everything throughout the entire life cycle is is really something that we're seeing a lot of folks um, come to us interested about. I'm going to say, yeah, we we see it quite a bit. It's one of the questions that everybody's asked. Our clients get approached by so many people in the industry and promise the world to them, right? Um, there's more and more companies joining the e-mobility revolution every day, every hour. And we represent a bunch of them. ABM has 35 
manufacturers and networks that we work with and partner with on a regular basis. And they all have pluses and minuses, right? Everybody does, because we're, we're still building this technology as we're moving, right? We're, we're making it better and growing it from the hardware to the software, to the interoperability, to the connections, to the cellular networks. There's failure points all the way along the line. We spent a lot of time today talking about power and site and availability, but those other items are just as important, if not more. Cybersecurity, you know, the federal government's coming out with their own requirements to make everybody better and stronger to meet their requirements. And it, it's just overwhelming to somebody that is trying to think about this and get into it to digest all those different pieces. So I, I can say everybody asks about everything every time you talk to them and understanding why they want to do that and helping guide them to the right solution for them and their company is very appropriate. And, and they're all valid solutions for right reasons, but making those choices is very critical. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Hans. Um, and then a question came in, actually, this is, uh, um, uh, regarding uh, uh, Energy Star certification. So I know uh, I had looked into Energy Star certification uh, a few months back. I'm not as familiar on the kind of uh, current up to date. I think I remember, um, uh, I, I guess, um, and if uh, this person submitted, if it wants to, uh, if I missed the question, but uh, from my understanding on Energy Star was primarily around standby energy and overall energy efficiency, um, not as much on the, the two-way or vehicle to grid side of things. But um, I guess maybe as a question to uh, Sarah Thomas, are you, are you seeing the EPA's um, Energy Star certification uh, changing requirements or, or changing anything in the market or something folks are fairly easy able to, uh, to meet or uh, too soon to tell? I'm going to go with the too soon to tell. Um, not not hearing too much about this, you know, especially when it comes to bi-directional chargers. We're hearing about UL certification, Rule 21, interconnection certification, and a lot of that things um, using ISO 15118-20, which has been recently mandated for a lot of um, funding in, in the country. But um, I, I personally have not heard too much on the Energy Star front regarding this. Okay. Yeah, and I guess um, I have to, to the specific question, is it hindering the, the work of the vehicle to grid and ESBs? Um, I don't think so, but I'm not sure. I guess something maybe I need to look into a little bit more. So um. I don't think the Energy Star is holding it back. I mean, the Energy Star rating is very easy for the level two chargers, yeah. the AC chargers. The DC chargers, not so much, right? It's it's not an energy, it's a rectifier, it's a control system, it's maintaining the heat and the temperature in the cabinets. So they're not going to be easily energy star qualified because they are consuming ghost energy when they're on. And I don't see that correcting itself in the future, right? Because of the nature of that equipment. Yeah, yeah it's certainly more of a challenge. I don't know, I don't think it's, um exotic or out of reach, but if someone didn't design their current system for sale to that standard, it would, it would I'd agree, it would be um, potentially pretty hard for depending on how they, how they do their switching and uh, standby losses. So. Um, excellent. Um, and then uh, Thomas, I guess, uh, thinking about, you know, just um, EV kind of uh, EV planning and um, kind of expectation management. I think um, we're getting uh, ready for this mentioned um, kind of the, the obvious first call that needs to be made before you call anyone else um, to steal your thunder is the utility. But if you can talk a little bit more about, you know, um, really what that means, uh, you know, it's uh, calling your utility sounds obvious, but um, either what happens when you don't or, or what, what does that mean? Because everyone does say kind of call your utility, but if you can go into what that, what that really means. Well, I mean, first, you really have to understand what the utilities are in the U.S., right? There's corporate-owned utilities. There's um, the, the smaller utilities that are co-ops or groups, and each one of them have challenges. The 
larger utilities are just now starting to include EV charging into their design framework for their expansion, right? Because if it's not used or useful for making electricity, they can't put it in the rate structure the way they operate in regulation. So they're just now starting to get that EV power usage requirement into their futuristic plannings on the larger utilities. The small co-ops, it takes them a lot longer to raise the capital to build those expansions and need it. So if you're an Amazon location and you're gonna stick a new plant in a location that has a co-op utility, and you say, I'm gonna electrify my whole fleet, they'll say, that's nice, we'll see you in two years when we get the infrastructure there, right? So you, you need to start those conversations early when you, when you go into the utility and say, what do you have and where do you have it? Just because they have capacity on their grid, it may not be in the area you need it in. It may be a mile down the street. It may be in the site next door, but they can't get it to you on this area, right? Um, the right-of-way requirements. Believe it or not, I've had right-of-ways that were in the plans and the blueprints around to bring power from the utility through somebody else's property to get it to our sites. And they took it to court to stop it because they didn't want that, that wire going over their property. Right. But that right of way was always in their property guidelines because you can't isolate it. So, I mean, that's an isolated case, right? But getting them on board quickly, talking to them and say, hey, listen, we're looking at doing something like this. What's your processes? How do you plan? What can we do? What's available? And they'll work with you. They're, if, they, if you go to them early, they love you because what they're getting right now is, hey, I bought 50 trucks and we're getting them in you know, five months. I need to have this power at my site, right? And they can't operate like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, excellent. I guess, um... Maybe uh, I think we're coming right up in the end. So maybe as kind of our closing question is a question on um, energy usage. You know, how, how is energy usage of a bus fleet estimated and modeled? And I just want to I catch that as a closeout question. Um, so I know Sarah mentioned uh, Mobility House has a number of tools that uh, charge, charge pilot that does that well. Um, uh, so uh, there's a number of ways, and I guess I'd want to, to encourage on that, um, you know, uh, make sure to kind of Thomas's point that you trust the organization that's that's answering those. Um, uh, and um, it's uh, like a lot of like a lot of modeling and analysis, you can get uh, pretty crazy answers depending on, on who you ask. Um, so do uh, do make sure um, Mobility House does that, um, CT does that, and I'm, I'm sure ABM does a uh, 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 number of ways of analysis to make sure that things are being sized appropriately. So um, I guess that my, my encouragement there is to make sure I uh, work with someone who knows how to ask the right questions that you can um, make sure you're getting the right answer because um, you'll, you'll get an answer <laughs> if you uh, if you ask the question on how much energy. But um, well, excellent. I uh, very much appreciate our speakers. Uh, Sarah and Thomas, thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us today. Um, we'll be uh, sharing this webinar out uh, with the attendees. Um, thank you all for joining and appreciate your time. Well.